Well, good morning everybody, and this is the 12th of April 2020, our third Sunday uh, in which we are giving our talks online because of the current uh, coronavirus thing. And uh, once again, thanks so much to Peter for helping me with the technology. Can we just turn to the Lord in prayer? Lord, we thank you so much uh, that today is the day which uh, Christians mark in their calendar with such importance. The day when your son rose from the dead, literally, physically, and for all eternity, illustrating that the victory won on the cross was real. And we thank you, Lord, for the importance of this day and what it represents, that if Christ wasn't risen, we would still be in our sins. But because he rose from the dead, it validated all that the cross means, his atoning precious blood. Thank you, Lord, that you have enabled us through uh, the internet to uh, look at your word together. And we pray, Lord, that as we are in the scriptures this morning, uh, it will not be the voice or mind of man that is heard, but something from heaven uh, to our souls. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise you. We praise you for this resurrection and the memory and the certainty that your son rose from the dead. Amen. Now I'm going to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, on page 1155, if you're in the Church Bible, and I'm reading from verses 7 to 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. It's an amazing thought, and it's the title of my talk, really. Strength in weakness. Now this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth. It's his second letter. And towards the end of this letter, we looked, I think, last week or recently at chapter 7, uh, where he had um, dealt with terrible sin and then was able to, with great comfort, I guess, see how the church had reacted uh, with a renewed zeal, a renewed carefulness. But then he goes on in chapter 11, and it's, it's very alarming. Um, and I'd like to read from there, that's the preceding page, 1154. Would God you could bear with me a little in my folly, for indeed bear with me. I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I've espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And here is an alarming truth. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. That is a shocking um, statement of their, their vulnerability and their potential unfaithfulness to the truth and the vision that they've had and the ministry that they've had from this great man. Now Paul is conscious of their state and it is very telling that the account that he gives of his supernatural experience which precedes the reading in chapter 12 and I'll mention that in a moment he gives because he feels, feels compelled to. He doesn't want to. He certainly doesn't want to boast about the glory of the experience that he had. But he, it is, and it's very telling that they need convincing about this great apostle, their father in Christ. They should have hung on his every word and responded with careful, prayerful obedience. And so reluctantly, because they don't, he's telling them of that experience. And you can read it in chapter 12, not now, but he says, 14 years ago, I was taken up into the third heaven. 
I don't know if it was a vision or if it actually happened. It was so real. It might have actually happened to me. And I heard things from the, I guess, from the mouth of God, uh, which I can't even tell you. So mystical, so divine, so secretive. And I can't even tell you. And so I was given this thorn in the flesh. And in verse 7, which is the beginning of our reading, lest I should be exalted above measure, in case, because of the abundance of revelations, that I was made privy to things which no man on earth knows about, which makes me so special. That's the danger, that he would sense that. I was given this terrible thing that torments me from the enemy. And... Um, we should be so careful about those who instruct us, particularly the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should respond to him without the need for any kind of elaborate confirmation uh, of his credentials, his, his right to minister, his right to speak. And that's how the church at Corinth should have been, but they weren't. And so Paul has to tell of his experience reluctantly. I want to look this morning at five points from this passage. One, what praying really does, what it really does, well at least partly so. Secondly, how God's answer is always best. Thirdly, how strength comes in weakness, and that's the theme of my talk, strength in weakness. Fourthly, the extraordinary danger and potency of pride. And fifthly, the need to seek God. We don't always get what we ask for. In fact, I think frequently we do not get the answers to prayer that we want. And this is certainly the case with Paul. Three times I besought the Lord that this thing might depart from me. We don't know what it was. It may have been a physical weakness. We're not sure of what it was. But it was an impediment, he felt. Something that really obstructs my ministry. That humiliates and upsets me. And I want it gone. And three times I've asked God to get rid of this thing. And I would imagine they were very intense prayer sessions. I think Paul was a man of very intense prayer. And certainly when we are troubled by something that is so hurtful and trying, we do pray with real sincerity, don't we? We pray with maybe desperation. And I think that's the impression we get from this. And... God doesn't give him what he's asking for, which is for this thing to go. But what always happens is that when we pray, what is best for the one praying and what is best for God's will and purpose is always done. And can I make this statement with absolute conviction? In every human life, in every human difficulty, in every human situation, for God's children and for those that don't know him, even for his enemies, always, with no exceptions, the will of God is absolutely best. And it is to be part of our emphasis in prayer. It's part of what the Lord taught us to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever really reflected on that? I've probably often spoken about it. I think about it a lot. Because it's an extraordinary prayer. Can you imagine what it's like in heaven? We don't know about the third heaven where Paul went to, but in heaven at all. How all is love. All is light. Every being there, angelic and human, loves to obey God totally, instantly. There's no resistance. And God is saying, bring that kind of regime down to earth in prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What power is in that praying? And we, and we need to get the vision of that, that, um, that truth, that direction from the Lord when we pray. Something that is different to what man can do, different to what man can know, but which is perfect just like it is in heaven, coming right down to this terrible, difficult situation that we're engaged with, that we're praying about, this person in that difficulty, or that, that situation in the country, or whatever it might be. 
the will of God done on earth, and which is always, always best. I want this thorn in the flesh gone. It hurts, it humiliates, and just when I'm feeling that it's gone, it reasserts itself, and three times I've pleaded for this. And the answer from God is this. No, Paul, it stays. And the reason is so that I also can stay with you. That's the reason. Because one trace of pride, and I will leave you. That's God speaking, isn't it? And you can, if you read right through the scriptures, the truth of one trace of pride and God departs. Paul, you will have my strength and you will need my strength because the battle isn't yours and your strength wouldn't be anything like sufficient in the kind of spiritual battles that you're going to be involved with and that we as a church are involved with and will be involved with. Uh, those battles which we've got to fight only with the strength of the Lord. Uh, but none of the proud have God with them. None of them do. Even especially, I would say, proud preachers, and there are plenty of them, actually. I think of some we won't name names, with their white suit that cost I don't know how much, and a £30,000 watch. And there is only humility if we're going to be serving God with any real effect. And this, to me, when I was thinking about this incident where Paul um, has had this remarkable revelation and he has uh, heard things which nobody on earth has ever heard, perhaps, or could be conscious of, and he's not even, it's not even, uh, he's not even allowed to tell anybody. And he has, therefore, to be kept humble. And in verse 7, in lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. See how Satan was involved in this, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And I prayed three times, and I prayed with tremendous, desperate intensity. I can't stand this thing. Take it away. But the answer given is much better than what he wanted. And it reminded me of Jacob at Peniel, where, you remember, uh, Jacob had taken his brother's birthright, he'd taken his brother's blessing, and uh, Esau uh, was angry and vengeful, and had made up his mind he was going to kill Jacob, and Jacob then has to go back to the old country of 20 odd years, where he marries and has wives and children, He's coming back home, and the Lord sends him back, and he finds out that Esau is charging towards him with 400 men, a little army that would just sweep him away. And he spends that night, it's in Genesis 32, please don't go there at the moment, but it's in Genesis 32, Peniel, where he, spent, he is terrified, and he spends the night in prayer, seeking God, pressing through. And that wonderful hymn of Charles Wesley, number 423 in our book, Come, O Thou Traveller Unknown. It, it's, a, it's inspired by that time when Jacob wrestles with God all night, with, not with God himself, but with an angelic being all night. And in the end, Jacob is changed. So that God could have knocked Esau off his horse and broken his neck. I mean, nothing, God could have dealt with Esau in a second. It's nothing, it's nothing to do with the problem. As with Paul, it's nothing to do with the thorn in the flesh. It isn't about that. It's about the perfecting of God's will in our lives. And that, certainly at the beginning of my talk, I guess is the main reason for prayer. Obviously there are prayers where we need answers. Of course there are. And there are plenty of scriptural examples of that. There's, a, there's an urgent need for an answer and God gives it when God's people seek him. Maybe now, in the time of this corona crisis, this pandemic, um, it's a time when we need to seek God for an answer. <clears throat> but it's a spiritual answer for our nation. A spiritual answer for our church. For our own lives even. But the chief point about praying is that it is about transforming us. And you remember at the end of that night of battling through, 
in prayer in Genesis 32 and uh, he he's fighting and struggling and pressing through all night and the motivation isn't a good motivation that he's just a man seeking God it's like most of us with human nature being what it is he's praying desperately energetically urgently because he has a problem he can't deal with he's been driven to that by a massive problem but whatever the reason the key is to pray all night long and he says I won't let you go except you bless me and the angel has to put his thigh out of joint if you remember but but he says to him, you're not Jacob anymore, you're Israel. Because a prince of God, because with man and with God you've had power and you've prevailed and you have changed. And that is what I'm sure God is wanting us to do, to pray in a way that we will be changed. When this crisis passes, and I guess it will pass, and we're back together serving God, hopefully um, all together, and making the most of the opportunity, the renewed opportunity to gather in the house of God and to be engaged in the work of God, we, we will come back with such a renewed vigour because we've sought God in this time and we've been changed. And I would say maybe that's the main burden of my talk this morning. Like Jacob at Peniel, and um, like here we're in the reading where <clears throat> Paul is so troubled by this awful thing, the, the thing that happens is that Paul is changed. Instead of wanting ease and deliverance, he says, and I'm reading on in um, at the end of my reading in 2 Corinthians 12, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. My whole attitude has changed because I've been shown the point. There's a reason for this trial, this humiliating thing that obstructs me. There's a reason for it. It is that you can be with me, so that because your strength is made perfect in weakness. And uh, though then in verse 10, I've changed my attitude. I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. All the difficulties that I meet with, I'm pleased because I know that the overriding hand of God is at work to perfect that which concerns me. And the one who opens doors no one can shut is able to do that because he can be with me because I am always going to be humbled, never going to be proud, never be self-sufficient, always relying on him so he can come right in and minister the thing that he wants to do. His strength made perfect in weakness. It makes way, our weakness makes way. If we're in the right spirit, of course, not if we're just feeble. That's not, nothing to do with being feeble. This is real strength. It makes way for the one who is omnipotent, who opens doors and no one can shut, who speaks and it has to be. It makes way for him to come in. And that's what we need as a church, desperately. My fourth point, I've done three, I haven't been ticking them off, but is pride. Pride. This was such a, even with the Apostle Paul, this was the danger that God saw had to be addressed and he allows Satan to buffet him. And, you, and we can imagine, well, I will never be proud. I'm, in, I'm immune from that. I personally feel that about myself. But as I say it, I think it's a danger in saying that. It's a danger in saying that. But it's a, the most foolish sin of all, isn't it? You know, the, the, the best man on earth, the brightest, cleverest, most successful, richest, most powerful man on earth, is a piece of dust rushing to a box in the which he will become dust again. Who is he to be proud? I mean, it's absolute folly, isn't it? Absolute folly. There are two examples, though, which make me, um, help me to illustrate that none of us can sense, feel and sense that we're immune from this. Even if we walk with God and we have spiritual principles in that direction from his spirit. Two Chronicles uh, 26, if you would please turn that in the church Bible, I'll give you the reference. This is about King Uzziah, a long and up until the end a very successful reign, page 499. All the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth, he restored it to Judah after the king's death with his father. 16 years old was Uzziah. 
when he began to reign, and he reigned fifty and two years in Jerusalem. What a long reign. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And then you get an account of the way he defeated the Philistines. He farmed and brought all the produce they needed. He built defense works right away from where they were, where the enemy would be dealt with immediately. But then you get this terrible thing, verse 16. But when he was strong, no, wait a minute. He sought, let me just go back to verse 5. He sought God in the days of Zechariah. He was under the influence of a man who had understanding in the visions of God. It seems as if while that influence was present in his life, he did what is always best. He sought God. But when he was, verse 16, page 500, but when he was strong, his heart was lifted up. But wait a minute, Isaiah, you've sought God, he's blessed you, he's prospered you. You've been so close to him, you've done so much in him and for him. What's happened? When he was strong. See, well, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Maybe if he had a weakness that meant him relying on God all the time, <laughs> this wouldn't have happened. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. You remember what he did? He went into the temple, he did what only the priest should do, and the priest said, look, don't do this, you're not, this isn't your place. And he refused to listen to what they were saying in the, in the word of God. And he was stricken with leprosy and he was in quarantine for two years. And his son reigned in his place, in effect. All the time he sought God, everything was okay. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. The other reference, and to me, it's more powerful and it's more immediate for us as Christians. In, in Acts 20, a New Testament reference. Um, this is where, this is on page 1105. You remember that the Apostle Paul is on his last journey, he's going up to Jerusalem, then up to Rome, to martyrdom, and then he, he summons, summons his, the leaders of the church at Ephesus, the Ephesian elders, they come 40 miles to the seaside where his boat's going to be and he gives them a sort of I won't say a pep talk but a most important discourse to invigorate them and remind them and prepare them now he's going to, go, now he's going to be gone and he gives an account of how he has ministered to them the time that he's been with them and the, the care the concern and um, the feeling with tears in my eyes night and day I warned and so on and then he says this take, um, wherefore I take you I mean Acts 20 verse 26 wherefore I take you to record this day I am pure from the blood of all men I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God I have told you everything everything of sound doctrine everything that heaven has to say to earth I have told you Take heed, and he's talking to the elders, take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And this is the verse, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, and draw away disciples after them. How can that be? Three years with the best ministry going, St. Paul, his care, his concern, ministry with tears in his eyes, night and day, warnings, patience, example, sound doctrine, and these men are called of God, they are real calling from heaven. But still, in some of them, the plague is still there. But once that influence has gone, there's a bit of pride. I want to be a somebody. I want a following. I want my name in lights. Is that really possible? Obviously, it's possible. He, he has seen that in them, even though he's done all that to minister to them. So I make my point again. Don't any of us think we are immune? And going back to 
to try to come to a conclusion. I've got one other reading after this, I'll be another five minutes, I guess. Back to 2 Corinthians 12, page 1155. Lest, verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. This stop me ever getting proud, pleased with myself. Absolutely stopped it by the work of the adversary to torment and hurt this guy. So what's the, my fifth point, the remedy, the importance my fifth and final point, the need to seek God. This is done by prayer and waiting on God. Taking the time. Having the sense to get close to the one who made us. And in his word. And it's amazing effect. And I'm in Psalm 19, a lot of you will remember this psalm because often before we look at the word of God on a Sunday morning we sing from this psalm I won't sing to you but it's about the power and importance of God's word uh, Psalm 19 on page 589 verse 7 the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Nobody. Cleanse thou me from secret faults. I don't know myself. Please look down inside me. Deal with what I don't even understand. And uh, correct me. And then in verse 13, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Pride being the leading one. And where is where all sin began? In that angel that got proud, you remember? What a what a torrent of wickedness followed that. I will be like the most high. I will ascend above the clouds and so on. What insanity. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I should be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So gladly then we voice with Paul what he says back in chapter 12, verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. But when I am weak, then I am strong. My talk this morning, strength in weakness. And uh, may God help us to uh, respond to what he has to say to us. Thank you so much. Thank you.